Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show where we talk with accomplished chess players, authors, and personalities about their lives, their careers, and how to improve at chess. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters and by Chessable.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. Before we introduce our guest, I have a very quick announcement. Some of you may have heard my interview with FM Peter Giannatos of the Charlotte Chess Club a few weeks back. Um, Well, he's got a new initiative that he wanted to let as many people know about as possible. And since he's a friend of the show, I'm happy to help out and spread the word. Um, They are launching a North American Corporate Chess League, which, of course, is going to be online given the pandemic starting in January. So you can recruit your coworkers and get involved. It's open to players of all levels. They're flexible on the number of team members. So if that piques your interest, um, you can go to what will be linked in the show notes or Google it or go to their Facebook page and find the information you need. But just something I wanted to make sure you all were aware of in case we can work to continue to grow chess at the grassroots and corporate level. So with that out of the way, let's get to this week's guest. I'm really excited for this interview. Um, Our guest is a strong player. He's a FIDE master. He's a working dad. He has a PhD in computer science. Uh, He works for Microsoft in in Singapore, although he is a native of St. Petersburg, Russia. He's also a chessable author. But what we're mostly here to talk about is his brand new and excellent book, The Life and Games of Vasily Smyslov with forward by Grandmaster Peter Svidler, by the way. Uh, John Hartman of Chess Life Magazine has already anointed it the book of the year. Um, Recent guest FM Karsten Hansen said it was brilliant. I finished the book last night just in the nick of time for uh, the interview, and I strongly concur with these endorsements. It's just um, um, incredible detail, beautiful physical book with great annotations and great perspective on uh, a world champion that Andre correctly identified as someone who doesn't get as much attention as some of the other uh, heavyweights of chess history. So super excited to talk about the book and to bring our guest in. So let's do exactly that. FM Andre Terakov, how are things in Singapore? Hi, Ben. Really happy to be here. And thanks for inviting me to your show. I'm a big fan and uh, I listened to your podcast for more than a year. It's uh, my uh, constant companion on my morning runs. Oh, that's nice to hear. <laughs> yeah, th- thanks. I really appreciate that. Um, so you're joining us from Singapore. So it's uh, evening here, morning there. Um, of course, Singapore uh, has some other prominent chess players. Uh, Kevin, Grandmaster Kevin Go, who had a popular interview. Um, so how did you end up there, Andre? Um, that was because of work. So I uh, worked for Microsoft for many years now, and uh, I moved around uh, with them. So I used to live in Germany and Ukraine. And seven years ago, I moved here for you know, like for my new position. And I really like it here. The kids love it here. So we actually stuck around for even longer than I initially planned. Excellent. Yeah. And how's the uh, how's the chess culture? It's uh, very interesting. It's very different as well. So um, basically, you've got tons of really strong, very young players. Uh, and uh, when I just came here, you know, like I started losing rating in my blitz and rapid like instantly. Like they are fantastic and they're super underrated. Everyone is here. And um, they're young, they're fast, they calculate uh, like uh, computers. And it's very difficult to deal with them, really. Like, as, like you can maybe beat them when they're like 13, 14 years old, but then uh, many of them like overtake you. The problem here is like after that, because it's a very um, kind of results-oriented society, a lot of them uh, basically drop out of chess. They go to universities, they start working. Uh, there is also like a mandatory uh, army here for, you know, for uh, Singapore uh, citizens and like permanent residents. So. For a lot of them, like once they hit like 16, 18 years old, chess is out of the picture. So unfortunately, a lot of them really drop out. But other than that, so it's a really, really interesting environment and lots of strong players. And as I was saying, like probably underrated players. Yeah, I know that Kevin Go, when he described being there, that he had to travel far and wide to find to to, to play tournaments. So I'm sure that that can impact the rating right. if it's like uh, if it's rather secluded. 
It is, it is. Um, there are not that many tournaments on this side of the world. Like, uh, I did play a couple, uh, but you have to travel, like, say, Vietnam or Thailand or, or you know, like some of these countries. And uh, for a lot of local players, if you really want to play a couple of tournaments in a row, and especially if you want to increase your rating, they go to Europe for, let's say, like a couple of weeks a month. Okay. And I know that you did an interview with um, your fellow Singapore resident, uh, famed chess historian Olympia Urkan, where you went into the background of your your Smyslov book a little bit. But um, could you could you tell us a bit about it? How did how did you decide to t undertake this project when you have so much else going on in terms of your professional life and having kids as well? Um, sure. Um, it actually started almost randomly. Like, um, um, I think I really need to roll back to uh, like almost 10 years ago uh, when I was living in Ukraine and Kiev. And so my daughter was studying chess at the time. And so every now and then I would take her to the chess club and just like wait for her to go through the lessons. And uh, um, I bought a book there. Um, it was in Kiev. Um, I bought uh, Smyslov, uh, you know, like kind of a magnum opus, so to speak, uh, called the uh, in Russian, I think it was uh, like it, it was later published as Smyslov Best Games in English. It's like a thick red book in Russian, like 326 games. And I had plenty of time on my hand and I was in a chess club, so plenty of chess sets and nothing better to do. So I went through the whole book uh, slowly but surely, like it took me probably like almost a year. And I was really um, amazed, you know, because like he's such a great player, Smyslov, uh, and almost unknown. And, you know, I studied chess myself. I... I grew up uh, uh, in Soviet Union and then Russia, and like I studied chess with the great coaches. And uh, I, I saw many of these games, but somehow I realized I didn't know the player all, all that well compared to other world champions, right? And so, and there were no books about Smyslov either. I, I checked, right? So the, that thought was kind of gnawing at me. And uh, a couple of years later, when I realized there is still no book about Smyslov, and uh, I, I was already here in Singapore, and I was yeah talking a lot to my friends. There, there are a lot of uh, great uh, chess players and authors here. So, like Olympio is obviously a shining star and very famous on Twitter, and uh, but he's great chess historian. Um, uh, we have Kevin Goviming uh, and Junior Tay, another author, and so like they kind of were like gently pushing me to this decision, even if they didn't realize that. So. Uh -huh. At some point of time, I, yeah, like I decided like, I'm going to do that. Uh, I started writing, and initially I, I thought it was just like writing a single book, you know, like a typical collection of games, more or less. Um, but the project was growing so fast, and I was discovering more and more material, and it turned out like I, I was also enjoying them a lot. So by the time I had um, my first draft that I sent, started sending out to the publishers, I already realized it's probably going to be bigger. And... Well, by the time I wrote like a thousand pages, I realized it's probably going to be more than one volume. So that's how this book came about. So basically, it's just the beginning of what's probably going to be a much bigger thing. Yeah. So he, you mentioned to Olympio, he said it might even be a four-part volume, which is just shocking to me, especially again, given that you you know you have plenty of other responsibilities. So when you started to hunker down, I know you've been writing this on nights and weekends a fair amount. How did you, how did your family take the news that uh, <laughs> you were going to be undertaking this project? Um, not too well, but then again, you know, like. Um, I always found a way to find me busy, you know, just like even even if it was just playing chess tournaments. So basically, I started playing less and writing more. So, <laughs> so probably that was there. Um, uh, they they took it all right, but uh, yeah, it was a mammoth uh, undertaking, and uh, yeah, it was taking me away from my family. And that's also like one of the the first thing I was writing in acknowledgments is like, yeah, like uh, uh, I'm really thankful to my wife and my kids because like not just me being absent or writing but also like i kept on telling different stories about smyslov and like i think i'm, I'm pretty sure my son probably knows about more about smyslov like than pretty much anybody out there uh <laughs> just by you know enduring these random things uh from his father for like a couple of years yeah and i hear that your son at least has been a chess player as well is he still playing um, not too much, no. So um, the, my kids were kind of on and off, and um, but yeah, like the, he was playing for a while um, here in Singapore, and on, and even like uh, when uh, all this coronavirus thing started, he was playing online. He was studying with the coach. Um, so like um, that, that's the story. Like for example, how I uh, wrote this uh, chessable course into nice defense. It was actually for my kids, right? So like they were, 
they were playing that with black and I decided to kind of create a small repair to them. And the same story happened, like started with uh, like 10, 15 variations and grew in like in the full course that I just decided that this was already like uh, probably worth, you know, sharing with everybody else. So yeah, I think it's like, um, that's probably the story of me. I start small and then like it grows into something really <laughs> that I cannot handle myself maybe even. Yeah, and uh, Geert Vandervelt from Chessable did mention to me that he tried to convince you to charge for your your two nights course, and he couldn't even convince you. So very generous of you and listeners. That means you guys can go grab it. Yeah, it's uh, still out there, and I think it's uh, yeah, like some of the uh, reviews were also like, "Wow, I cannot imagine <laughs> these things being free." Like, think of that, like almost like an open sourcing that knowledge. Yeah, that's great. And of course, I always try to check out uh, an author's work, but I was so busy reading the Smith's Love book that I, I didn't get a chance to check out the Two Nights course again. Um, so let's let's bring it back to the book, Andre, the actual contents of the book. So I thought it might be fun to begin to talk about by talking about Smith's Love as a chess player. Um, and of course, um, my Patreon you know, shout out to all the Patreon subscribers. You guys and women are great, but you've been slacking on the questions lately. So I went out to social media and got some great questions. And I know that um, the Chess Book Collectors group, I've seen several people post excited for this book. Uh, David Lado on Twitter um, couldn't wait to, to, to purchase it. And we got some good questions. But I thought initially, let's try to figure out what we can learn from um, Smith's Love's chess. But before we go any further, Andre, I thought it might be fun if you could read the first few paragraphs of the book, if you're if you're ready to do that. Sure, sure. Um, let's start with that. So um, I can read probably a couple of uh, uh, sentences from the introduction there. Um, so yeah, the book opens with the following things. Um, Vasily Vasilyevich Smyslov, the seventh world champion, had a long and illustrious chess career. He played close to 3,000 tournament games over seven decades from the times of Lasker and Capablanca to the days of Anand and Carlson. From 1948 to 1958, Smyslov participated in four world championships and mounted the toughest challenge to the great Mikhail Batvinik. Smyslov and Batvinik played over 100 games, uh, which is about 10% of all games that Batvinik ever played in official competitions, and their rivalry was one of the primary intrigues of the chess world in the 1950s. Smyslov finally became the world champion in third attempt in 1957, but lost the title in the return match with Batwinik the following year. Smyslov continued playing at the highest level for many years and made a stunning comeback in the early 1980s, making it to the final match of the candidate cycle. Only the indomitable energy of 20-year-old Gary Kasparov stopped Smyslov from qualifying for another World Championship match at the ripe old age of 63. Yeah. Yeah, the 63 thing, that just floors me. So he he won the candidates in 53, uh, the famed, you know, every week, listeners, right, every week right. you hear Zurich 1953 get recommended. Uh, spoiler alert, Smyslov won that tournament. And then for to to then get make it to the semifinals of the candidates and only get stopped by Kasparov, um, and, you know, in terms of a quest to be playing the world championship at the age of 63, right. it's just a, uh, a staggering feat. So, of course, we've got a lot of adult improvers uh, listening. So actually, um, I think, let me, sorry, let me just scroll. We got so many great questions. Uh, this is from uh, Shubham Kumtakar on Facebook. Um, so he asks, he says, about Smyslov's amazing yet surprising run when he reached, reached the candidate finals against Kasparov. What do you think was at the heart of this brilliant performance? Um, that's a very interesting question. I think, you know, um, the main thing that motivated Smyslov uh, at that time was that he was kind of written off, literally. Like, um, uh, he was really kind of uh, in the background for uh, most of the years after he lost the World Championship, right? And um, uh, he was strong enough to be, like, in the top 10 or around that, but um, he was not at the forefront, right? And um, by the end of 1970s, beginning of the 1980s, he was already kind of falling out of favor also with uh, um, a leadership of the Soviet Chess Federation. And he, he was uh, overlooked when uh, the tournament invitations came up, or at least that's how he saw it. And that motivated him. And he really started working much harder than he probably did in the previous decades. And that's what really made a difference. He was still enormously strong. And when he put his heart and energy into that, and a little bit of luck, well, more than a little bit of luck, by the way, that's also <laughs> needs not to be forgotten. But yeah, I mean, uh, at his peak, he was still, he could really be 
uh, one of the strongest in the world. He was, I think, if I'm not mistaken, he was back to like uh, uh, number three in the world uh, at the time by rating. I, I might be mistaken, but he was really, he was really kind of going through the second spring. That's just just incredible. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> you could write a book about that. And we should say, by the way, that um, Andre has alluded to the fact that this will be a multi-volume project. And of <laughs> right. course, we're asking we're asking him about a moment that he hasn't arrived yet in the book because uh, volume one covers up to 1948. So yeah. we've got a, way, a ways to go, but I'm sure you're reading all about his whole life as you go. Yes, yes, but it's probably going to be like, I don't know, volume four. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we'll be we'll be old men by the time we get to that. And <laughs> to I was that actually interview. talking to the publisher. I was here, like um, uh, making a suggestion. Like I already have uh, volume two mostly written, but I was like, hey, like how about like I publish volume five? Like do the Star Wars thing, you know? <laughs> and get oh, to like, the point that most ever, yeah, like or get to the point where which is most interesting probably to everybody out there. But uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes. That would be funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Maybe not. So, <laughs> and of course, we got a few questions along the lines of this one, who a uh, uh, beloved friend of the Twitter community, Martin, aka Say Chess, who asks, uh, "What can club players learn from Smyslov's approach to chess?" Um, that's a great question. I actually wrote an article about that, and I hope that it uh, it gets published sometime soon on uh, chess.com. But yeah, I, I think there is a lot that you can learn from Smyslov uh, and his approaches to chess and his um, ed chess education, I would say. He was very different and he was brought up different. But I think some of his, um, uh, uh, some of his approaches uh, we could learn from. So First and foremost, like um, uh, the importance of studying classics. It's uh, I'm writing about that in the book, but basically Smyslov didn't play a single game outside of his home until he was like 14 years old, right? And he learned chess uh, seven, eight years before that. He learned chess at six and a half uh, as he was writing. So um, for seven, eight years, Smyslov was only studying books and playing his father and his relatives. Okay, his father was a strong player, That's that helps. But um, his father also had a library of like a hundred books. And Smyslov is writing that he read them all. And um, I guess with that kind of uh, chess education, with that background, uh, you really can grow into a fantastic positional player as Smyslov did, right? So, and I, I probably cannot imagine anyone today like reading a hundred books, but, you know, especially now like that the whole year 2020, most people spent at home. That's a great time to study classic. I was almost joking, like Smyslov is a great uh, kind of a pandemic role, role model, right? Because he right. he was spending seven years at home and then he emerged from home like already as a complete player. So probably that one, so studying classic pays off, right? And another thing is that uh, there are many other things like, um, for instance, focus on end games. Uh, Smyslov is famous for that, obviously, but uh, there is a reason why. His father started teaching Smyslov uh, with end games, like literally like a, a rook uh, against the king or like a rook uh, and a pawn against rook, these kind of things. That was advice that was, um, uh, I think, given by Capablanca at the time, but almost nobody ever did that, right? So except for Smyslov's father. And so that, I think... Um, uh, formed Smyslov's style to a large extent. And until the very end, he was always fond of like exchanging queens because he was always confident he, would, uh, he could outplay almost anybody in the end game. And he did, right? Yeah. So, there are, um, so there are other things, but I think these are the two main um, uh, interesting traits in his character, in his style that we can learn from studying classics and end games. Yeah, I liked uh, in your interview with Olympia Orkan where you you referred to him as like a precursor to Alpha Zero because he's just doing chess all on his own and then comes out and he's super strong. Yeah, um, yeah, he, he was amazing because like um, I looked at his earliest games and he was also like he was even mentioning that um, he thought that he didn't really change much since like the time he was like 14, 15 years old until the end of his career, which is okay, an exaggeration for sure. But yeah, he really um, emerged to the world as a really well-rounded player. Yeah, and a couple other things I highly highlighted because I know listeners are always looking for improvement tips, as as am I. I was uh, struck by his emphasis on physical training. You had a quote in there where he said, like, if he has a big tournament coming up, he's focused more on actual physical training than chess training in the weeks before. And that, of course, reminded me a bit of our current world champion. Um, 
And of course, like a lot of uh, the guests on the show, he expressed uh, a love for endgame studies and s solved a lot of endgame studies along yes. the way. Yes, yes. And yeah, and uh, physical training too. And uh, um, uh, he was like uh, uh, rowing and boxing. He picked up boxing actually in the 60s. I don't know. Like there is, a, I have a photo of him like in the, with the boxing gloves. That looks very unusual. So yeah, but I think it's also like um, his, uh, his approach was typical for the time because uh, a lot of the players at, at that time, they realized the importance of physical education and also kind of downplayed the importance of chess preparation, I would say to some extent. Yeah, um, which I don't know if that works as well for adult improvers because the thing about these top <laughs> players is they're, all, they're already so strong, whereas like uh, everyone in the rat race is trying to catch up. So, um, but certainly don't neglect physical fitness. I would say. Yeah. Um, so, and here's another question. This is from Albrecht goes on Twitter. He says, uh, "Greetings and looking forward to the podcast." Uh, related to his proverbial chess intuition, is it true that Smyslov did, really did not calculate that much? Um, not, not really. Uh, so he had fantastic intuition. And yeah, like, uh, there is this quote, like Spassky called Smyslov the hand, right? Uh, so because like he was saying that Smyslov doesn't need uh, to think his hand knows where to move the pieces. And it's true. I mean, he had this knack for kind of getting pieces to the optimal squares, but Smyslov did calculate and he did it really well. I mean, it's actually surprising. Um, I was going through his annotations. He very rarely makes mistakes in uh, variations. And you know, like if you're going uh, over the older books, there is plenty of that. Obviously they didn't have the computers and like sometimes there are, you know, glaring like kind of holes in uh, analysis, right? In Smyslov's case, not so much, but also for a reason, because um, uh, I think that he generally had such a good position to start with that tactics generally worked in his favor. And he saw that. I mean, he was uh, he was great at calculating short tactics, like uh, sometimes like two, three, four moves, but maybe in an unexpected move somewhere, right? So, uh, and uh, that he saw and his opponents didn't. And it worked for him because his positions were so good right? So like in some cases, like there is this saying, like in bad positions, every move is bad. So for Smyslov, it was the opposite. It was like for his opponents, it was like the bad positions where they're struggling with. But Smyslov was actually pretty good uh, in, with calculation. And especially when he was young, like that uh, volume that, uh, uh, you know, those years that I'm covering, he was actually pretty amazing with uh, his um, fantasy and uh, with his vision of the board. So I think it's a little bit like of... Um, a stereotype, and maybe also from the older years of Smyslov. But in fact, you cannot become a world champion without being really good at tactics too. Yeah. And again, there are so many good quotes in the book relating to to his style of play. And you've got a lot of uh, primary sources that you must have moved heaven and earth to track down. So greatly appreciate it. But I liked uh, the, the quote about his game from uh, Hans Kmach and uh, Max Oive, where they say what is what is noteworthy about Smyslov's play is the tranquility and the absence of mistakes. Yep, he was. Um, I think it's also like one of the things um, that's special about Smyslov. If you're looking at his whole career, and, and he was playing chess for like 17 years, <laughs> give or take, right? Um, and you take like the average uh, quality of the move. I think he was probably one of the highest average quality of the moves uh, in the history of chess. I think uh, there were actually studies like that, right? Like for world champions and other grandmasters, like uh, uh, how well they, uh, what the computers think about the quality of their play. And Smyslov is usually up there. He sometimes could uh, not, he was not looking for like absolute best move, like Kaspar, for example, does, or like I know Karchnoi does. But um, he, the moves that he saw, the moves that he made, they were uh, universally good. Right. So like it was really difficult to uh, handle that for his opponents. Yeah. He, of course, has the famous quote about just looking to make 40 good moves. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like and if you do that, that's a draw. Well, um, yeah, that's one of the quotes. It's actually, by the way, it's one of those quotes that's kind of difficult to source. Uh, um, but yeah, it was very much in his style. That's for sure. Yeah, and Kramnik had a you had a great block quote from Grandmaster Kramnik uh, in the introduction to the book about Smyslov's play as well. Um, I'm happy to yeah. read it, or you can if you have it handy. Uh, um, do you have a no, you go ahead. Okay. Um, so here's Andre writing. He says Vladimir Kramnik, incidentally one of the few world champions whom Smyslov did not meet at the board, also held the seventh world champion in the highest regard. And here's the quote. 
uh, quoted from an interview by Vladimir Barsky for the e3e5.com site. Smyslov is, how to say it better, the truth in chess. Smyslov is a player who plays very correctly, truthfully, with a very natural style. Why, by the way, isn't there any kind of mystic aura around him like there was around, say, Tal or Capablanca? Because Smyslov is not an artist in chess. His style is not artistic or striking, but I like his style very much. I would recommend studying Smyslov's games to children who want to learn chess because he was playing it as it must be done. His style is closest to some virtual, quote, chess truth. He was trying to play the strongest move in any position, and it is possible that in the sheer amount of strongest moves, he surpassed many other world champions. As a professional, I appreciate that. I know that amateurs are more interested in mistakes, up, up and downs. However, from a purely professional point of view, I think that Smyslov is clearly underrated. He got all components of his playing to a very high level. Smyslav was a brilliant endgame player, and his games sometimes looked like songs. When I browse through his games, there's an impression of lightness, as though his hand is making the moves by itself, and the man does not strain himself at all, as if drinking coffee or reading a newspaper at the same time. Almost a Mozart-like lightness. No strain, no tension. Everything is, ten every everything is simple, but brilliant. So also a brilliant quote that really gets to right, the heart of how right. he plays. Um, so we've got a couple more about how he played, just trying to um, pull out a few more lessons that we can all take home and then suddenly play like world champions. Um, so right. this one is uh, this one is from again from Shubham Kuntakar, who says when we talk about Smyslov, the first thing we are reminded of is those excellent end games. What are some lesser known facets of his play that we could learn from? Um, <laughs> that's um... That's an interesting question. So yeah, I, I think end games is the first thing that comes to mind to everybody. But he was much more than that. Um, one thing I maybe lesser known thing about Smyslov, especially in his younger years, and one that I uh, stress emphasize in, in uh, the book, defense. So um, Smyslov was like literally. Uh, I was looking at his games in the first part of his career, and he was like almost like a Houdini, you know, like not the engine one, but the one you know, like the the magician who was kind of uh, escaping the from locks and like from closed, uh, uh, you know, uh, rooms and so on and so forth. He very often would end up with a difficult position right out of the opening. So especially in the beginning, Smyslov wasn't really great, uh, like kind of with the opening theory. Um, but then uh, he he would be very difficult to pin down, and his opponents usually didn't manage. And you know, I actually like quote some of these games in the book where he starts out like with essentially the lost position, <laughs> and then somehow kind of wiggles his way out of that into like uh, eventually equal or maybe a counter attack or maybe like he's still losing, but it becomes muddy and kind of unclear, and then he wins, right? And I think that that was really something that helped him a great deal in the first part of career that, that I'm covering in the book, because um, especially when he was playing a stronger grandmasters, like Batvinik, Keris at the time, Ryshevsky, in the beginning, they were much stronger than Smyslov. But he was almost never lost to them either. I mean, like he couldn't beat Batvinik until like 1943, um, but um, he was actually doing pretty well comparatively, you know, uh, against Batvinik. He was very, very difficult to beat. And I think this like a kind of resourcefulness, um, this tenacity in defense is something that we can learn from young Smyslov a lot. I think I, I really appreciate that kind of facet of his game. Um, yeah, I, I was <laughs> I was pretty impressed playing through um, playing through his games and yeah, pretty a lot to learn across the spectrum in terms of how he played. Um, and then when we have um we have a similar question from a friend of the podcast, Christopher Shabri, um, but touches on a slightly different theme. So I'd like you to tackle this one too, if, uh, Andre. He says, uh, having presumably played through every one of his games and studied many of them in, in great detail, what do you think the rest of us can learn better from Smyslov's play than we can from games of uh, the other world champions or great players? Um, <laughs> right. Um, what Smyslov did better than other world champions? I think that's that's the question. Yeah. Um, so I think um, um, I will uh, dodge the end games because yeah, everybody's think about that. I'm, and I'm I'm going to touch on something else, and um, I think that this is a very important contribution by Smyslov, which is underappreciated and also kind of uh, not properly understood, and that is uh, uh, playing on, right? So essentially. Smyslov and his education was very much classical one. 
he played mostly very classical openings like Rui Lopez, you know, by the way, like he never played like, I don't know, like Italian with, uh, with white or he was playing standard openings, right? Like I'd, almost like a 19th century openings to some extent, although he also like uh, dabbled with more dynamic things like Grunfeld. But um, uh, in those openings, you often end up with a just equal position. So you equalize, fantastic, great. But if you want to become a world champion, if you want to beat, you know, if you want to win tournaments, you got to win those, right? And that's where Smyslov's technique came into play, right? So he would just like, okay, the position would be completely uh, equal. And I actually quote uh, uh, several uh, games like that in the book as well. Like, uh, for example, there is this game against uh, Golombek, Harry Golombek from uh, UK, right? A match between Soviet Union and the UK. It's completely um, equal out of the opening. Oh, by the way, another example is like Smyslov versus A- A- Avia uh, uh, in um, uh, Groningen 46 and eventually also in the World Championships, like similar scenarios. It's equal, but the game is not over. And he plays on, he makes strong moves, he poses problems. I think in 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 a way, he kind of... Um, uh, Carlson plays like that today, right? So um, Carlson is pretty happy if uh, the position is equal, but there is play left in that, right? So it's not like completely kind of vacuumed all the pieces of the board and you cannot do anything with that, like it's a dead draw. But if the position is equal but playable, uh, both Smyslov and Carlson... And I, I think, by the way, I in my mind, they're... They're coming from the same line of kind of world champions like Capablanca, Smyslov, Karpov, Carson. They have a lot of similarities between them. But I think, uh, especially in the case of Smyslov, that was like his discovery that if you just continue playing um, and you're satisfied with uh, equalizing with black, but then, you know, the position is still uh, alive, that you can outplay a lot of folks. I mean, like he was outplaying but Phoenix <laughs> among others, right? So... Um, that's one of the things that um, I thought was new. And um, at least among the world champions, um, his approach was uh, pretty special uh, uh, in that regard. He was the first to do that. And I think like probably Karpo for Carson would be his successors in a way. Yeah, and uh, this kind of ties into, this is uh, the last question on his playing style. Um, so again, at what you said kind of hints at what I believe your answer will be, but this is from uh, Claudio Alfares on uh, in the Facebook uh, chess book collectors group, um, longtime friend and listener of the show as well. And Claudio says, how would you rate his style in terms of complexity? I.e. is his style far too complex to understand for an amateur player? No, no, no. It's, it's actually the opposite. Um, I would recommend Smyslov to uh, any player out there. Um, and uh, I'm pretty sure you can understand his games, whatever you're playing level. Right, um, and in a way, it's almost like deceptively simple. I think there is a uh, quote by Kasparov there in the book as well, like he was saying, like, uh, yeah, like Smyslov looks very simple, but you know, it's uh, try playing against that, right? So, right, it's uh, also, um, I was talking to Peter Swidler who wrote the foreword, and I, I, I think he also even mentioned that in the foreword, like, um, he was saying something to the effect, like, I was looking at that, and um, I realized I would never be able to play like that, like Swidler says, right. Uh, and but you 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 get to appreciate it, right? So it's um it's like Mozart or, or I don't know like Chopin uh in in music, right? So it's simple, but it's um it's beautiful and it's really amazing. And and in in chess, I think that's uh really something that I really enjoy about chess. Like you know these games where it's you know it looks uh. Uh, straightforward, simple, you know, pieces are moving here and there. And then suddenly you realize like, the, the opponent is toast, right? It's like there's nothing you can do. And like you you even missed maybe the moment where, you know, like uh, it uh, went completely, uh, you know, like from slightly better to completely winning for Smyslow. He has plenty of these games. And I think this is something that a lot of, um, you know, players out there uh, would appreciate. Yeah, it's... um. Yeah, I agree with you that it's, if anything, it's the opposite. I always feel like the 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 most concrete players, I think, can be the hardest for club players to learn from because if they if they can just calculate, you know, these mind boggling mind bog <laughs> mind bogglingly complex um, sequences for twelve moves, that's that's tough to emulate. Whereas obviously there's a deceptive simplicity to Smyslov's games, but nonetheless, if you you know. Uh, try to deconstruct it for long enough, um, you can get somewhere. And of course, I, I really enjoyed your annotations as well. Um, so how, I'm sh- how much time, I know you also used a lot of Smyslav's own annotations, and I'm just wondering how much time did you put into your the, the actual 
just annotations as opposed to the biography? Um, <laughs> a lot of time. Um, and it's kind of difficult to separate the two, but um, I actually started by annotating the game. Um, and I um, I think that, that that work even kind of, some of that work even predated the idea of writing a book. Um, and uh, I analyzed it for myself also to kind of to figure out how these games work, right? And then I was kind of... Uh, what what often happens is like you you see enormous depths in that like you you know you know um that's also one of my learnings like I, I saw these games as a child right like my, my coach was a big fan of you know Capablanca uh, Smyslov you know like he was into these um uh, positional players um they these games often come with a narrative you know like basically like okay so you're doing this this and this and that and like you're playing all these beautiful moves and like the opening is like resigns <laughs> and that's by the way how Smyslov often annotated his games himself. And then I was um, I was looking at that, and I was discovering some of that um, narrative to be uh, simplified, right? And uh, that's where I was I was spending enormous amount of time, and um, maybe even too much time, and kind of getting too deep. But I really wanted to get to the um, kind of the the ultimate truth of that position of that game, right? And to analyze it and see uh, if there was anything that was missed, like for example where opponent could uh, pose uh, more problems to Smyslov, right? So that was probably uh, my focus. And I was also, um, I'm, I'm, I really like chess history. I was reading a lot of the old annotations and I was I was uh, always like comparing them. Like for example, Smyslov would annotate the, the game and then Paul Keres would annotate the, the game as well. And he would find errors in Smyslov's analysis and then Smyslov like a year later would publish like with, with a revised version and then Keres would do it again and so on. So it's like sometimes many of these Smyslov's games are famous and they were analyzed by dozens of different uh, chess players, grandmasters, right? And they have all the very different perspective and it's very complex. So I really appreciated that part. I really love that, uh, that part of working in the book. Yeah, and just obviously so much research went into it, which um, calls to mind a, a, a book that you quote several times uh, in, in the course of uh, your book, uh, uh, Legendary GM Jenna Sasanko's Smith's Love on the Couch. So Nicholas Noel asked how this book compares with uh, Sasanko's Smith's Love on the Couch. Um, they are completely different, but I would think probably they are complementary. And yeah, I, I'm quoting uh, Sasanko's uh, book quite a bit. Um, his perspective was unique. And uh, I mean, it cannot be really repeated by anyone else because he was very close to uh, Smyslov and also to other uh, great chess players of the past, right? Like he published several books like that also about uh, Karchno and Bronstein and so everything so, so forth. Um, but especially with Smyslov, they were close. And uh, um, he knew uh, Smyslov uh, to the level that probably few other people did, you know, ever, right? And Smyslov, it was enormously private man and um, uh, having this kind of uh, insight into how he thought, uh, what uh, kind of what he was saying that he would never say in public, these kind of things. So uh, from that point of view, so I, I can definitely, you know, recommend a Sasanka book to anyone to, if you want to understand the man behind the games. But it's also very different because Sasanka uh, book doesn't quote any games. I think there is like one game there, right? So Gerasimov, uh, Smyslov, the the famous first game, like Smurt, Smyslov's Immortal. But it's, um, and he, he only was giving like his personal um, uh, uh, perspective, their conversations, right? And there was like, uh, there were neither games nor kind of the biography, right? It was, you can, uh, learn about Smyslov the man, but you cannot find out, uh, like, for example, where he played, how he got to become a world champion and stuff like that, right? So, like, it's it's more, it's like, it's almost like flashes, you know, and... Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's uh, so they are very different, but um, I really, uh, I, I loved uh, Sasonka's book and um, I definitely recommend it, but basically they're just slightly different. And in my case, obviously, I didn't have access to Smyslov. I mean, I only saw him a couple of times in my life. Um, and... Um, I, I yeah like my favorite story is like I when I started writing on the book uh, I started writing this book I realized I actually have his autograph uh, um, when I was like 13 years old or 14 years old I was uh, playing somewhere like in Moscow in Alekhin memorial memorial for kids right and Smosso was a kind of a guest of honor and I approached him and Miguel Nardif and took their um, you know signatures like they uh, wrote uh, signed in my you know notebook. And I completely forgot about that. So, like, to me, I didn't know Smyslov at all, right? 
So Songa had the chance to talk to him for years and decades uh, on end, right? And very closely. So obviously I had to do something different. So I was relying on um, publications, on journals, on uh, newspapers, on his personal archive as well. Um, it's really, uh, for me, it's really amazing that the most interesting things I learned about Smyslov were the things that he deleted, that hmm. were not published, right? So he was really intensely private. And uh, uh, he would write things and then he would read it and he realized, well, I don't want to see it in press. You know, I don't want to see it in print. And and like he would scratch like the paragraphs. And um, I they, they survived in his archives and I was able, uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to get access to this archive. And like I rescued some of them from, you know, from oblivion. Um, but it goes to show that um, I th also think, by the way, that's one of the reasons why Smyslov is so unknown, why he's so underappreciated as a, you know, as a world champion, because he didn't like to talk about himself. Like, if there is any, like, if there is any learning about non-chess related learning from the Smyslov stories, like, it's really hard to be an introvert in this world, you know, like, basically, um, in Sasonka's book, I think there is a quote, like, hey, like, uh, uh, Smyslov, like, was very confident about himself and his position in history, and like, okay, like, I don't need to uh like they will write about me well guess what nobody did <laughs> for like uh, um no one like uh, for example that small soft personal archive nobody even approached uh, uh that like nobody talked to the to his hairs you know like uh and that's i that really kills me like in in the modern world you really gotta not just play great chess you also need to be uh talking about your own chess and smith never did Right. So that's also one of the challenges that I faced when I was writing this book. Yeah. And that actually answers another question from Michael Moore about why he was so forgotten and over uh, underlooked or overlooked, however you want to phrase it. Um, and I want to hear more about uh, Smith's love away from the board and how you got access to his archive and all of that good stuff. But first, uh, let's take a break, Andre, and hear from both of our friends at Chessable. As always, Perpetual Chess is proud to be brought to you in part by Chessable.com. Chessable is a chess learning website that utilizes its Move Trainer technology to help you learn and remember opening lines, tactical patterns, and end games. It is endorsed by GM Magnus Carlsen and features courses from I am John Bartholomew, Sam Shanklin, Wesley So, and so many others. Chessable has over 100,000 members and features hundreds of courses, both for free and for purchase. So if you haven't checked it out yet, please go to chessable.com and take a look around. Back to the interview. So Andre, you just alluded to the fact that you got access to Smith's Love's private archive, but I enjoyed the details that you shared with uh, Olympia Orkan about how that came to be. Could you could you tell the story of how you ended up going to St. Petersburg and uh, uh, unearthing Smith's Love's own um, chess archives? Sure, sure. It was Moscow, so Smyslov was a Muscovite uh, through and through. Um, but um, when I started working the book, uh, and I was in Singapore at the time, remember, it's like on the other side of the world. Um, so I I got um, uh, all sorts of um, books and journals. I have a huge library. I kind of became a books collector uh, throughout this project. But obviously, at some point in time, I, I started looking out if I could find more unique material. And um, what I did, I reached out to the chess historians that I knew um, in, in Russia and in other countries. But obviously, I was mostly looking for the Russian historians and uh, trying to see if I can get a hold of um, Smyslov hairs, hairs. And um, um, so I uh, contacted uh, Sergei Brankov, who is a great uh, chess historian, very famous one. And by the way, his uh, book about uh, Soviet championships, chess championships is uh, finally appearing in English, apparently, sometime now. Um, yeah, okay, right? Yeah, it's and it's fantastic. I have all three volumes in Russian, and they are amazing, really. And um, so I uh, asked him, and he uh, just connected me uh, through Moscow Chess Club to uh, so Smyslov's uh, relatives, um, and um, I uh, talked to them, uh, like a couple of emails, phone calls, and stuff like that. And then less than um, a month later, I was uh, sitting in the airplane, like from Singapore to Moscow, and um, so I spent the next week um, at Smyslov's uh, house. So Smyslov uh, spent uh, the rest of his life uh, uh, at the house out, just outside of Moscow in a very kind of 
what is now kind of a posh uh, and very wealthy, expensive uh, kind of uh, elite <laughs> area. And, and it is elite. It, it is really, it was already probably at that time. And um, so I was uh, spending there, like, I don't know, arriving there at 8.30 and like until late evening, I was just going through his stuff, um, you know, boxes and boxes and boxes of stuff, you know, um, papers, photographs, uh, you know, books, uh, medals, God knows what. And uh, um, the, the first, you know, day I was literally just like literally open all the boxes to find out what's inside. It was it was like uh, it was like magic, you know, you're like in these, uh, you know, a treasure chests. And uh, um, and then I spent the rest of the time just basically taking pictures and scanning everything. I, I knew that I wouldn't be able to kind of work on that right there. I just wanted to capture as much as possible um for my work and um yeah after that i spent literally more than a year just sorting it out already like back home um and working through that um and a lot of that material actually was included into this book um, um yeah, i only focused when i was there on uh the time from beginning of smyslov's career until let's say 19 uh, the end of 1950s right so like to his uh, world championships matches because that's where I, I plan to uh, stop uh, with the first book. It turned out to be okay. By now it's two volumes, not one. Um, but um, there is plenty still uh, of, you know, research that needs to be done. And I'm, I'm planning to return there, uh, like, once I'm done with the first two volumes. And, um, um, yeah, that was really an amazing experience. And, like, um, the whole environment there, uh, like, you're literally, like, you've seen that in books. Like, for example, in Smyslov's, uh uh, that uh, Sasonka's book about Smyslov, they are mentioning like Smyslov's cat, Belka. And right. that, I actually uh, uh, saw that cat, uh, like was the first you know, thing to greet me actually <laughs> when I arrived. And I didn't even realize it was the same cat, right? Like, I mean, Smyslov was gone, but the cat is still around. Right? Yeah, he passed in 2009, right? And this was eight uh, years later? Uh, 10, yes. So um, uh, it's, um, um, yeah, it was 2007, seven years later. Okay. Right? And um, yeah, and by the way, the cat is uh, used like Smyslov used to really pamper it. <laughs> it's a bit of a spoiled cat, right? I would say, but yeah, <laughs> yeah like, he, he's great. And uh, um, and uh, yeah, so that was a very interesting experience. I also spent a lot of time um, going through the libraries, you know, like in Moscow and in Saint Petersburg. Eventually, uh, in my hometown, when I was going back there and during the summers, uh, and kind of uh, getting. Um, uh, old newspapers, right? So, like, for example, I was looking for older games by Smyslov. Unfortunately, his uh, pre-war archive perished during the war. His, uh, his uh, home was bombed, like his house uh, disappeared during the war in 1942, I think. And um, so all the papers are gone, right? So, like, uh, whatever was not published in the press disappeared, unfortunately, which is also one of the reasons why we don't know so much about Smyslov, a young player, right? We know more as an established player. So, um, yeah, uh, that was a lot of um, uh, kind of uh, work trying to get uh, scraps and pieces of information uh, uh, about Smyslov in 1930s and 1940s. So it's nice that they put you in touch with his family and that you were able to go to to his estate um but who did you besides seeing his cat who did you personally interact with uh, <laughs> yeah, in, in order yeah. To actually... yeah I probably should have started with that so um smyslov didn't have he uh, didn't have children right so uh smyslov was married uh his wife had the child from uh, her previous marriage and it's also a tragic story that uh yeah i'll have to cover in uh, volume three and then i'm already kind of I'm already set just thinking about that. Um, but so they didn't have children after that. Um, Smyslov, uh, 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 so basically uh, the whole estate uh, now passed to his uh, relative from his wife's side, right? So okay. he family. And um, uh, like uh, essentially his nephew, like uh, he was, Smyslov was calling him a nephew. Um, and um, that's uh, basically uh, who the whole uh, you know uh, estate belongs to. Um, um, uh, obviously, Yuri no, knew Smyslov. Like I, when I, I remember in the first email when we were exchanging, like I was writing about Smyslov on my project. And I'm like, uh, yeah, like um, uh, I only knew him since I was five years old. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> that's that's, that's um, much more than I could ever dream of, right? So there is also plenty of stories uh, that he shared uh, uh, about Smyslov. Some of that also were included into the books, like some kind of a first-hand uh, uh, experiences with uh, Vasily Vasilyevich.
And Brian had another question relating more generally to his relationship with uh, the USSR government, which of course um, we've already touched on a little bit, but maybe you could um, flesh it out a little more. So Brian asks, he says, was he hindered by the USSR government? He he wasn't as, as good at playing politics as Botvinnik. Later, I sense that he was set aside in, fr in favor of the many younger talents in the Soviet Union. Um, not that he would have, but he it seems like he could have benefited by defecting a la Korchnoi. I disagree that he was uh, hindered by the government, or like he was uh, not as good as playing politics as Batwinning. He was actually very good at that, just very different. Um, but Winning's approach was kind of very heavy-handed and he was kind of uh, take no prisoners approach, right? Smyslov and his character was more on kind of building coalitions, uh, working from, you know, behind the curtain. And in fact, I would say that it's exactly the opposite. In 1960s, 1970s, Smyslov wasn't really uh, playing that great. I mean, he was really in, in quite a bit of a slump. I would say, uh, for for many reasons, you know, like personal reasons, you know. Uh, um, but he wasn't really um, his heart wasn't into that, um, and yet he was constantly getting invitations to the international tournaments. He would travel all over the world. He would play like you know in these Capablanca memorials, or like he would play in the Netherlands and uh, everywhere really. Um, and he, often he would take places of the younger players. And actually, um, there are also some stories that aren't. Um, that nice uh, about like Smyslov basically bumping off uh, other uh, Soviet players from uh, the tournaments that they earned the right to play in, right? So, in fact, he was really, uh, I think his connections to uh, the powers that be like were as good as anyone's. Oh, um, interesting. Yeah. So, and like there is like, for example, uh, the, the, there is a story that. Uh, it's actually it's going to be in the second volume, like the Central Chess Club in Moscow, which I visited uh, when I was there, and which is named after Batvinik now. But the thing is that it was probably uh, thanks to Smyslov as much uh, as it was to Batvinik, maybe even more, right? Because basically uh, uh, the, the story was like they didn't have a club, like a central club, didn't like they didn't have a location. And um, what happened was uh, Smyslov um, just. Um, uh, got to know a person like an architect, like an architect uh, who was in charge of Moscow development, right? He lived next door to him, right? So, uh, and invited to the birthday, whatever, like, and basically just kind of, you know, like a uh, small talk. And uh, and then like he mentioned, like, like well, we're looking like, we, we don't have a a, a a place for chess players. We're looking for one, can you help? And like, essentially it was something as simple as that. And they got that, right? So it was literally... Uh, okay, like it was, uh, the petition was signed off by uh, Smyslov and Batvinik together, and uh, it was uh, a lot of work after that. I think Alatertsev, uh, uh, the, uh, the Moscow master, did a lot of like leg work to make it happen. But this kind of just gives you an example. That's how he worked, that's how he played, right? So, in terms of his connection to the US Soviet government, he was really in a good shape. He was, uh, and he, by the way, he wasn't even a member of the Communist Party. He avoided that for all of his life. And yet he was uh, really, he had a very good standing with, uh, you know, with the powers. Uh, so, yeah, he he played it well. He just played it differently. Yeah. And you mentioned in the book that not only was he not a member, but as you're able to discern from, from his archive, he really wasn't a big communist sympathizer. Oh, no, no. Yeah, it's... Uh, uh, and uh, but that, that was also like that was not unusual. So um, there were like these things where you were supposed to say, <laughs> and, like you know, like uh, standard formulas. You know, like uh, what they call like whatever performative actions, right? So like uh, you're declaring allegiance, and like uh, I, I, you know, I still remember like the standard phrases you were supposed to say when you were joining, like the youth communist league or like the pioneers and stuff like that. So everybody remembers that. So, um, and as long as you were kind of saying that in public, you were good, right? So, and whatever you thought in, in private, uh, well, I mean, pretty much everybody was thinking something differently. So he was really adept at that. And Andre, I can't help but ask, I'm just curious about hearing your own story. I mean, um, so you were, you grew up, uh, you're 43, I believe. So that would have been like the tail end of uh, the, the Soviet, um, you right. know, the Soviet. 
Soviet regime. What what was how were you raised, and what was your belief generally in uh, in what you were taught? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think I'm pretty standard product of that system. I I was born during the times of what is known like a Brezhnev stagnation. Like there was a Leonid Brezhnev. The, uh, he was like. Uh, before Putin, he was the longest serving, you know, <laughs> in power in the in the Soviet Union slash Russia, um, and um, that was like, you know, like um, there is another book I, I really like. I mean, it's a very obscure book, but I really like its title, and I actually read the book because of the title. It was uh, called uh, "It Was Forever Until It Was No More." That's exactly how I felt about the Soviet Union. Like I, I was, I remember growing up and thinking, "Oh my goodness, there's going to be a fantastic celebration of 100th anniversary of the." Great October Soviet Revolution in 2017, and I'm going to live to see that. <laughs> and then, like 1990, 1991 rolls around, and like suddenly there is no more Soviet Union, there is no more communism. Like, oh my goodness, what was that? Right, and everybody like as if wake up, wake up from a coma or from sleep, right? So, and everybody suddenly, you know, like it appears like nobody ever actually believed in communism. Like nobody did. Right. So, but you, but everybody was saying that in public, and like you were kind of uh, so, like it was a really interesting, uh, I guess, experience growing up. Like uh, I absolutely believe that you know this Soviet thing is going to be yeah, like in my lifetime, right? And, and I'm sure Smyslov obviously thought the same. You know, like him growing up, uh, like uh, you know, in uh, already through the Stalin times. So yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting to hear. Um, and so getting back to Brian's question, so as far as you researched, did it sound like Smyslov ever gave any thought to defecting? It seems like he was pretty no, shrewd. No, and no, pretty... no, 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 yeah. no, 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 I, I'm pretty sure it never really crossed his mind. And, uh, um, Smyslov, uh, I mean, he carved out a niche for himself and he was very comfortable in that. I mean, um, and I, I almost think like he was also very comfortable being a, a former world champion. So like there is no pressure on that on you, right? Like you don't have to defend the titles against all these kind of energetic newcomers. Um, he was strong enough to kind of hold his own against anybody in chess, right? But he didn't necessarily have the motivation at, at, at least until 1980s when he was started, you know, being forgotten or that's how he felt. So um, he had all the kind of material comforts uh, that the Soviet system could afford, right? He was well connected. He didn't need to de fact. I mean, okay, Viktor Kashina obviously needed that, right? I mean, yeah. he would never probably get to the pinnacle of his, you know, chess uh, without. And then obviously he was probably even hampered by, you know, the fact that he did it so late in his career, right? But Smyslov, I don't think he ever felt the need to do that. Yeah, I mean, it seems like he had a he had a pretty pretty good life, um, as at least um, without getting too political. At least as far as as you say, as 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 well as one could live within the Soviet. Yeah, uh, and I think he appreciated that. Like he was very, um, I don't know what how to put it, like balanced. Uh, he was really uh, not uh, looking for you know stress and excitement. Um, like there was, there is something like a, almost a Buddhist uh, about Smyslov. I mean, I know it's kind of fun thing to say about uh, uh, a Russian, you know, kind of uh, Orthodox Christian. But he was this kind of very, uh, uh, you know, centered, balanced person, and so he lived his life in at, at his own pace, and he was comfortable with that. Okay, and. Uh... And um, we have one more question. Uh, I believe this one's from Twitter from Nikosi Nukaleko. Sorry, Nikosi, if I mispronounce your last name. He says, um, how much was Smyslav's musical career affected or influenced by his chess aspirations? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I, <laughs> I actually going to cover that in volume two um, quite a bit. Um, in, in 1950s, Smyslav was seriously considering like uh, dropping it off uh, like in chess and, uh, you know, starting to pursue like opera singing. So he had a um, great voice. His father also had uh, like, it, it runs in the family, uh, both his father and uh, Smyslov Jr., quote unquote. Uh, they were both singers and um, uh, they played piano and obviously both of them played chess. Like I, I was saying that Smyslov uh, spent his life realizing his father's dreams in a way. Um, and um, in late 1940s, early 1950s, Smyslov actually um, uh, started uh, pursuing the passion uh, of singing. Um, he found himself um, uh, a teacher uh, from uh, like uh, in Leningrad and now St. Petersburg. 
And he then spent a lot of time, like kind of um, uh, going to from Moscow to Leningrad and back, um, like I don't know, almost every other week to take lessons in singing. And he participated in auditions uh, in both in uh, 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 Moscow and in Leningrad, and uh, and actually the, not just any theaters, like in Bolshoi Theater in Moscow and in uh, uh, Kirovsky now Mariinsky. Uh, opera theater in Leningrad, St. Petersburg. And he was close. I mean, like um, in Bolshoi Theater, he actually made it to the second round. Um, and also he knew uh, uh, the uh, musical directors of both of those theaters. So he was like, uh, like in 1951, 1952, we could probably, there was a likelihood that we never would see Smyslov winning Zurich 1953, you know? Wow. Um, he was probably that close. Um, and also his chess career was on a, you know, going down at that time, really. I mean, he was in a bit of a slump. And the time was, I think also for Smyslov, again, like here I'm kind of already um, uh, conjecturing, uh, but um, Smyslov also was, uh, remember that was still st uh, during uh, Stalin's reign, right? So uh, 1951, 1952, it was really difficult time. It was... Uh, Everything was kind of clamped down. Um, I'm not sure if that's a coincidence or not. I'm still kind of uh, uh, figuring out uh, my own narrative for that. But Smyslov chess career really took off only after Stalin uh, died in 1953. If you look at his results in 1951, 1952, there is nothing to write home about. I mean, at least not for Smyslov, not for his caliber of player. And in 1953... Uh, uh, Smith, uh, so Stalin dies what in March, and then Smyslov plays in a training tournament uh, they organized in Gagra uh, for like preparing for um, uh, candidates. Actually, there was not for the candidate; it was for USSR USA match that never took place. He Smyslov wins that, then he goes to uh, Switzerland and wins Zurich, uh, and then he kind of plays for the World Championship. It was literally it was very short, like it was complete turnaround in a matter of months. And before that, Smyslov was struggling. So, um, yeah, like, uh, to it, it's a long story, but he, I thought he sought refuge in music in early 1950s. And yeah, there was probably a moment where it was affecting his chess career negatively. And I think the, he the, the was kind of trying to escape from, you know, whatever, you know, maybe just the pressures of living in a, uh, uh, in the Soviet Union at the time, and then only in 1953 he completely kind of abandoned his uh, singing uh, in favor of chess, and then he had like his uh, really kind of uh, best years of his life as a chess player. He returned to, to singing much, much later, like uh, what 30, 40 years later. And I actually have recordings here at home of uh, oh, wow. myself singing, like uh, both like I don't know. Uh, uh, audio cassettes and CDs and uh, you know like vinyls and stuff like that. He was uh, uh, he was really good as a singer, like as as far as I can tell. So like uh, he could probably have made it. Wow, yeah, and of course um, he he had some notoriety as a chess player as well. And you allude to him living during the reign of Stalin. I also enjoyed. Or I don't know if enjoyed the right word, but I found fascinating the sort of intersection of uh, his ascent or the beginnings of his ascent taking place during World War II. And you're, you're trying to piece together what exactly happened during those years. Um, I, do, do you mind just touching on that a little bit, Andre? Yeah, yeah. And it's also, it's also the, the time which is um, the most difficult to kind of track, right? Um, chess publications basically, you know, uh, cease to exist. Right, um, um, like there is a year in Smyslov's life where it's absolutely zero records of him um, anywhere. Right, so like the only like um, it was like 1941. So the the war, uh, the Germans, you know, uh, uh, Nazi and Germany started uh, this kind of a uh, campaign against the Soviet Union. They were uh, at the out on the outskirts of Moscow, and that's when Smyslov was evacuated to Kazakhstan to Almaty. Right. And um, he was a student at the time, and um, he was also like uh, apparently exempt from military service because of his uh, horrible eyesight. And um, he uh, landed there, and he spent like almost a year not playing chess at all, studying at the uh, institute, right? Uh, and um, uh, there are only few records. Like I found a letter from 
one of his uh, fellow students to him, like that was written like in 1950s when Smyslov was already kind of uh, battling for the world championships, like just remembering those days, right? Like when they were living in a dormitory there and like uh, with almost no food and whatnot. And another one, uh, it's also uh, it's a very tragic story that I actually even uh, tracked separately. Like there is a, um, a story of Smyslov's uh, childhood friend uh, called Bayzad Zagurov. Um, uh, he was very... Um, notable person there in pre-war times. Uh, he was like chess player himself, pretty decent chess player. He actually uh, famously beat Smyslov um, in the Champions, like uh, uh, beat him to the championship of the Institute one year, like uh, by winning a direct encounter and also like defeated, I know, like Lasker, Lilienthal, Spielmann in um, uh, wow. in uh, simultaneous exhibitions, right? So like uh, all in one year. So he was pretty good. Um, but so Zagurov, um, uh, like he was a couple of years older, and uh, so he finished his studies and he was not exempt. So he went to war, died literally in the first, you know, uh, skirmish. Uh, like they, they didn't even like um, had time to unload from the trucks. Like they were already kind of that was already a shootout. He was injured and uh, like uh, he uh, survived like for like. Uh, two or three weeks after that with the wounds in both his leg and then he died and so like the only other way uh i know that where even smyslov was was smyslov writing a letter to uh, zagurov's uh, mother um uh, in 1942 like i think it was march 1942 it's in the book actually um so um uh asking like what happened right uh, are there any traces of his friend like is there anything that's going on and and also like sharing a little bit like about what, how he's doing there in in uh, in Kazakhstan, um, and so I was um, also like by chance encounter I uh, ran into um, uh, I, I managed to track down the relatives of Bayzet Zagurov, and they actually have his papers, records, also like games from 1930s uh, preserved, right? So that was also uh, a surprise find, and so yeah, it's all in the book there. But um, the war years were really tragic for everyone, obviously. Um, but, uh, so Smyslov in a way, like kind of, uh, uh, was relatively lucky. So he didn't, uh, he did he wasn't sent to war. He, okay. Languished for a year in Kazakhstan, but okay. Like, uh, it wasn't that bad. Um, then by 1942, summer 1942, he was already playing again. And actually I would say he made his next leap, uh, in his chess playing strength and his career during the war, he kind of he established himself firmly as a second player in the Soviet Union behind Batvinik. Before that, like you, in 1941, you couldn't say that about Smyslov. There were many other uh, challengers, right? You had Keres, you had, you know, uh, uh, Bandarevsky was, uh, and Belislavsky, uh, plenty of other players who could really challenge Batvinik. By 1945, it was clear, Batvinik number one, by far, Smyslov number two, and again, like with a, with a, by a, by a large distance from everybody else. So that really helped to kind of uh launch his career international career once the war was over like if not for those war years and like smyslov kind of winning pretty much all the moscow championships that were playing during the war probably he would not be sent to groningen in 1946 which was kind of an informal candidate tournament so yeah so uh war is a tragic part of chapter of history and I'm, I'm trying to cover it as best we can, um, but there is very little record there. And uh, and by the way, uh, like I published this book and I'm still thinking like there is so much research that still can be done, should be done, you know, like uh, looking at the, you know, all sorts of primary sources or like just, you know, digging through the newspapers or uh, publications, uh, you know, in the libraries. So there is a lot that we still don't know about uh, Smyslov uh, in uh, pre-war and war years. Well, it makes me all the more grateful that you have undertaken this project. Again, it's just um, so much information and so so well presented. Um, so one more thing I would like to hear about, Andre, if, if you're okay on it um, time-wise, um, sure. is uh, you, you told the story to Olympiou of how it is that you got uh, Grandmaster Peter Svidler to, uh, to write this forward, and I thought it was kind of fun. So uh, yeah. let's hear it. Well, yeah, I, okay. Well, here I kind of... Uh... I pulled the card of the childhood <laughs> connections, really. <laughs> so, um, um, yeah, like I, I grew up in Leningrad, St. Petersburg, and uh, it was a pretty good place to grow up as a chess player. <laughs> so we had like Svidler, we had Kamsky, there were like many other players that uh, like uh, became grandmasters. I know uh, Yemelin, Lugavoy, like uh, uh, Sergei Klimov that I later like uh, battled in my junior championships of the city, right? 
Um, so yeah, and so I knew uh, Peter uh, like from those years. Um, but uh, I mean, obviously, he became super grandmaster very quick. Like he literally made an enormous uh, leap in his uh, career. Like I think around the age of like fourteen or so, right? Like it was it was uh, unbelievable. Uh, Kamsky as well, uh, and um, the, uh, so um, I didn't have any connection with him. And like I, I, uh, I wasn't even sure that he remembers me. But like uh, many years later, I'm already like 30 years old and living in Germany and uh, and just okay playing at a local uh, chess club, uh, at the same at the same club as by the way the football club FC Bayern also like one of my <laughs> association because of that. And um, um, we were an amateur team, but somehow we made it to the first Bundesliga in Germany that year. Like I was playing uh, uh, in the second Bundesliga and like we won it uh, narrowly and we qualified to the first one. And uh, and like we literally like we have one grandmaster on the team, also like kind of semi-retired, like uh, he was relatively young, but like he wasn't really playing chess professionally anymore. And um, and then like I international masters and like folks like me, like every every everyone on the team is amateurs like uh, they were not paying us either and so on and so forth so like i think they were um kind of covering the expenses of our trips but then uh, we played um my first game in the bundesliga and b- believe it or not um i got to play for my team literally against the strongest team ever baden baden like i mean like the, the guys they won bundesliga <laughs> i think almost yeah. every year that, that i remember <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so like, and the team like I'm looking at their like starting list, and it's like uh, Anand, and uh, you know, like uh, I don't remember if they had Carson or not, but basically like it's like who's who, like top ten, right? And uh, uh, Shirov and uh, Svidler as well. <laughs> so I got to play against uh, Pentala Hari Krishna, um, uh, and like completely wiped me off the board. Uh, <laughs> but so like I, I'm walking in there and like I'm sitting at the board writing down and like Smyslov sits opposite from me like uh, so sorry not Smyslov Svidler obviously <laughs> so, and like and looking at me like quizzically like what are you doing here like uh, like so, so like I, oh my goodness he remembers <laughs> but second like uh, it's a very difficult question to answer because like yeah well, I'm, I'm actually like we're completely out of our league I mean everyone in our team like eight people right <laughs> so, like the question what they're doing there like yeah well so yeah, we, you can- like in a chess sense or like in a in germany sense <laughs> no i i don't i'm not even sure <laughs> maybe both um so yeah like we chatted after the round uh, uh a little and uh like uh, we kept uh uh you know like kind of a, a bit of a connection like uh, uh on facebook and whatnot and so like when i started working on this book i reached out to him and uh just you know asked for a favor <laughs> and uh so um uh, and um he asked me to send he, uh, the book, right? And he read it and like, uh, and then he kind of, um, you know, it went back and forth, but then he uh, liked the book and he agreed to write a foreword. And uh, yeah, it, I think it was also very nice and um, um, of him of doing so. So I'm, I'm still, by the way, to send him the book that after it got published. So uh, probably next on my to-do list. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, uh, that was probably the, how these foreword came to life. Uh, a little bit of like, uh, yeah, you know, like uh, connections here. Yeah, yeah, I love it, and of course, not surprising, being that he's a legendarily nice guy that that he agreed to do that for you. Nor is it wholly surprising that someone with a, a memory like his would remember you after all these years. Yeah, uh, I mean, like he even remember what we played. I mean, like I don't. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that happens a lot with the stronger players. They they just, it's amazing uh, how many details they can remember of. Uh, games from decades ago. Um, So one last question, Andre, I think, um, because clearly you've got more volumes to write and we'll need to have you back sometime as you continue to, uh, you know, to uncover more information um, and and we get some more great questions. But I know you've you've mentioned that one of the uh, sort of casualties of writing this book was was your own chess game. Uh, time time you might have spent playing blitz or studying or thinking about a tournament uh, fell by the wayside. But do you feel like um, you've you've learned something about chess from playing through these hundreds of games um, of Smyslovs? Oh sure, no, I mean. Uh... I definitely learned a lot. The question is, can I implement that in the game? <laughs> so, I, 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 I'm absolutely sure that um, I learned a ton from, you know, replaying Smyslov's games and kind of analyzing them. And uh, uh, um, it also probably, maybe it influenced a little bit of my uh, playing style. Um, uh, 
I really like the way, uh, you know, Lex Maslov also, you know, kind of uh, treated the openings. Uh, he was, uh, it's also an interesting thing, like he never really, um, he, he didn't have a reputation as a huge theoretician uh, ever in his life. It was probably one of his weaker sides. But if you look around, like, and see how many variations are named after him, like in every opening, like you have some sort of variation, I don't know, like in Grunfeld, in Rui Lopez, in Slav Defense, uh, in King, you know, like almost every, right? So um, that was also something that I started, like, appreciating, like, uh, where he had these, especially towards the end of his career, he was playing all these slightly offbeat lines that were still solid enough. And so that's, I uh, I started kind of, uh, looking into that and uh, before like a uh, uh, pandemic hit and I was also thinking like about playing that in a uh, serious tournament although like uh, obviously never happened but um, I think I, I learned a lot uh, I would love to maybe one day also kind of return to <laughs> playing practical chess but the problem is like if I'm looking uh, ahead of me and like at least I have second volume to churn out and kind of get published right so and I, I won't be able to kind of sleep uh, well before at least I do that. Uh, and yeah. I'm hoping to do that maybe next year, by the end of next year. Although, like, you know, all of my plans, I usually get delayed uh, because it always takes longer. Like, I was joking, like, I had the book written for, like, I, I thought I had a book, like, 80% written. Um, and then, like, I, I spent, uh, I realized I, I spent 80% <laughs> of the time after that. So... You never know, but um, yeah, like one day uh, I I want to also get back uh, once I uh, maybe I have at least most of this Smyslov project behind me, get back also to my playing days. Yeah, well, hopefully I'll uh, see you at a tournament someday because I I feel the same way. Although I don't have this uh, you know tremendous gift of to the chess community that this project is uh, standing in my way currently, so I might get out there a little sooner <laughs> a little sooner than you. Um, so again, I just want to thank you, Andre, for for this. Uh, again, it's just a, a wonderful gift to the community. It's a it's an amazing, beautiful book, and obviously, with uh, with all that you've got going on in your life, you're you know you're not doing this uh, for the money. You're doing it for the love. You you recognize something that needed to be written, and you're bringing so much information to light that that might not have otherwise uh, found its way to so many um, chess enthusiasts. So so thank you. And thank you, Ben. I, I really hope that, you know, um, uh, I know that a lot of people are listening to your podcast like I am, and uh, I hope that they will just discover uh, this book and maybe uh, uh, give it a go. And uh, I would love to hear from you about this uh, book and what you think of it and uh, uh, keep your feedback coming. I still have more volumes to write. So um, uh, anything that I didn't made, I uh, didn't manage to do right in the first volume, hopefully I will be able to fix in the next one. I don't know. I mean, you got the stamp of approval from John Hartman and Karsten Hansen. So that's that's a good start and myself as well. And I actually wanted to announce listeners, um, I'm going to try something new. So Andre, in order to get this book uh, as uh, expeditiously as possible to me, had his um, his publisher, Russell Enterprises, send me a book. But for all of the effort that Andre did, I do want to try to buy at least one book so, for Andre. So we're going to do a little contest. So uh, listeners, what I want you guys to do is anyone can write a review on Apple Podcasts and email me a screenshot um, by January 8th is the deadline. So email to ben at perpetualchesspod.com. Of course, it has to be a five-star review. Or we're going to tip the scales here. Um, but even if you've already done a review, you can do one again. So anyone who does that and sends me the screenshot, I will randomly select one person and get you a physical copy of Andre's book. That definitely applies if you're in Europe or the United States or Canada. If you are somewhere else, I still recommend you enter. And if we end up with some technical difficulties in uh, in getting you the book, we'll make it up some other way. So I uh, just want to try this out and see how it goes because I'm just uh, so grateful for this project. And I know that um, you you sacrificed a lot to, to write it. So, so thanks again, Andre. And you're on Twitter, on Facebook. Um, is there a preferred way for people to... Uh, to give you the feedback that you just mentioned, Andre? Yeah, Twitter, Facebook is probably the easiest way to find me. Uh, so, uh, and uh, on Facebook, I think I'm just like uh, Andre that uh, the first name, that last name. Uh, and on Twitter, actually, I can't remember my handles, DDTRU, and I don't even remember why. Uh, but yeah. yeah. And chess.com as well. You blog there. You've oh, yeah, some yes, of yes. And you can also, uh, by the way, like 
on chess.com i uh in a run up to the publication because this book went to print like in august and uh, <laughs> i had nothing better to do so i was uh writing um articles every now and then uh, especially around uh, about the earliest years of smyslov's uh career and also including some of the things like i couldn't include in the book like i know videos about or photos uh or some of this content that you know didn't make it into the book or like was more you know tangential to that but i thought it was still uh i wanted to share it because uh i thought it was very interesting material so yeah you can also look it up there on chess.com okay excellent and so i'll put the all these details as well as the details about the book giveaway in the show description and andre thanks again i already can't wait for volume two but take your time writing it i know you've got a lot going on absolutely thank you ben okay have a nice day there in in singapore and i'll call it a night here in new jersey T take care andre thank you bye-bye thanks as always to my producer matthew passy and to everyone who helps spread the word about the show telling your friends writing positive reviews on podcast platforms all of that stuff helps you can follow me on twitter i'm at beneficial one join the perpetual chess facebook group you can find the link on the website and we are back in action on instagram at perpetual chess sharing a weekly clip from the podcast so follow us over there as well but of course, the main purpose of these credits is to thank everyone who makes the show possible by their financial support. Without you all, Perpetual Chess would have ceased to exist a long time ago. And for that, I am forever grateful and work to continually improve and expand the offerings from Perpetual Chess. So without further ado, I would like to give extra special thanks to the following people and entities. Chessable.com, David Lazarus of LazmanChess.com, Quality Chess Books, The Capital City Chess Club, The Abysmal Deaths of Chess Blog, Adapta Interactive Web Designs and Services, The Apprentice Twitch Channel, Andrew Alharji, Andrew Bach, Anidi Deer, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Bill Sigler, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, The Charlotte Chess Center, The Chess Central's Chess Blog, ChessMood.com, Chris Flanagan, Chris Lott, Dan O'Hanlon, Daniel He, Danny Davidson, David Schreiber, Derek Jones, I am Dimitri Schneider, I am Eric Rosen, Eric Tam, Ewan Richardson, Farhan Thawar, Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Glenn Downing, Greg Harfs, Greg Shahadi, Gregory Gulick, Guven Manet, James Kennedy, Jeff Martinson, Jens Green, Jeremy Nielsen, John Jernigan, John Rockefeller, John Cromarty, John Mar MacArthur, Kelly Palmer, Kevin O'Callaghan, King Selt, Lucio Casada Silva, The Law Offices of Stuart Katz, Matthew Feeney, Michael Can, FM Michael Oblin, Mike Zelazny, Mr. Mike Shahadi, The Famous Mr. Dodgy, The Nerd Nays Twitch Channel, Peter Sodi, The Playmore Chess Academy of the Hampton Chess Club, Reuven Fisher, the Seattle Chess Club, Shane Unger, Stephen Kelty, Stephen Martinez, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryan of StrongChess.com, Todd Kennedy, The Vintage Patsers, which is a Chess.com improver group, Wayne Beam, William Hogarth, Aaron Waffler, Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, FM Andre Terakov, Dr. Andrew Perry, Barry Hessian, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, Bruce Scott, Brian Tillis of Palm Beach Chess, Chad Hilton, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Wayne Scott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, aka Chess Explain, Coach J's Chess Academy, Corey Budson, Costa Chorus, Courtney Fry, Craig Mallon, Daniel Ginsburg, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Bleskacek, David Brown, David Hamblin, David Cramley, Dalen Shelton, Dennis Parrish, Dirk Decker, FM Donnie Ariel, Douglas Matthew, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Emmanuel Langlois, Robitai, Ethan Smith, Hallelujah Cat, Ian Mason, Indrick Ryland, Felipe Melo Pereira, Fox Valley Chess Club, Francis Latart Lavoie, Dr. Frank Tortoris, Frank Zananis, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt, Gene Stewart, Gerard Barta, Giovanni Russo, Han Schut, Harish Renivasan, Howard Vihan, Jacob Kovacs, Jacob Turan, Jacques Perry, James Espinwall, James Banastia, James Muir, Jason Willem, J.G. Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Yep Hoyland, Jerry Wells, Jim Ratliff, John Tully, Juan Almaguer, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurty, Jonathan Slater, John Tully, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, WGM Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, Grandmaster Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, 
WGM Katerina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, Kevin Boyce, Kevin Pryor, Kior Gada of the Lakeshore Chess Club, I am Kostya Kavutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Kyle McAvoy, Larry Ryforth, Laura Boyovsky, Macaulay Peterson, Mark Miller, Martin Knudsen, Martin Krug, Matthew Passy, Matthew Tedesco, Matthias Plock, the Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Michael Hudson, Miguel Araspidi, Mike Clem, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Salon, Neil Bruce, Nigmat Malajanov, Nicholas Isabel, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Randy Tempo, Ricky Grijalva, Richard Hallenbuck, Robert Tichi, Robert Turner, Rory Coleman, Rory Yearwood, Ryan Berg, The Say Chess YouTube Channel, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Sebastian Finsterwater, Walder, Shane Unger, The Sil- Silver Knights in Richmond, Stefan Roller, WGM Tatia of Abrahamian, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tom Edsel, Tomas Komanich, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Vishnu Srikumar, William H. Brock, William Juniper, William Peterson, FM Zhao Cheng of of chess1000.com and of course Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks for listening everyone. We will be back next week with another episode of Perpetual Chess.